history of menswear is often omitted like it were it never existed or like it was only the background for women fashion. On this channel I would like to change it and reverse those proportions. Today we will have just a quick and short look on the changes of men's fashion during the period of time uh, beginning from 16th to the end of 19th or maybe mid of 20th century. I will concentrate uh, specifically on the clothes and on the main part of clothes. I will not be talking about shoes or some headwear, but I didn't forget those topics and I, I hope to take care of them in the next episodes. My name is Katarzyna Andres and this is English translation of the podcast Men's Site of Fashion. Today I will be speaking about men's fashion between uh, 16th and 20th century. This video will be a little different than the previous ones which you can find on my channel. Starting from today I am changing the context and the type of videos which I am producing and I will create some introductions uh, in videos like this one and the main part of the episode will be um, just like presentation. If you are interested in something specific, let me know. Just write the comment or some information in my social media and I will try to gather resources and prepare the episode in the topic which is interesting for you. So let's not waste more time and let's just go to the topic of today's episode. In fact, to explain any modern element of fashion and to find its source, we should dive into the beginnings and the way the fashion was born. I should start from the pre-ancient times when people were nomads and when they were hunting for some animals in wild forests. And when in this time clothes were made from leathers or furs. Then, on, and only then, I should follow how some elements changed through the ancient times and the Middle Ages and only after that I could go into early modern and modern times. Okay, this all sounds well for some who like mystery and riddles, but for me it's not really so much interesting. And I don't want to make you bored already in the first episode talking about something which is not convincing even for me. I will just start with early modern era and then I will move to current times, but slowly. The basic element of menswear from 14th to 17th century in Europe was a doublet. This was just some kind of tight jacket which was padded and canvassed and during Middle Ages it was often worn under the armor. During this time the legs were covered by some kind of trunk hose or breeches and those trousers could reach as far as calf or they could be shorter and finish on tight, depending on era and the region. Those breeches were fastened together with doublet to secure one element together with the other and that fastening was usually at least partially covered by the skirt or laps. For a long time the connection was simply achieved by using eyelet holes and ribbon. Sometime later metal hooks and eyes came into use and in that time the ribbons did not completely disappear. They were still used as well but sometimes they were only used as a decoration. When the hooks and eyes took over the stabilization purpose and the ribbon became only a decoration, it was still used but only in some countries and the parts of the century. It is similar with the shirts. What was worn and uh, specifically when was different between the regions. 17th century is the time when in general the ruffs uh, worn around the neck were coming out of the fashion. They were replaced by collars which could be embroidered or consist of laces and some of that collars were worn over picadil or other kind of stiffenings. Of course not everyone could afford laces. There were many models of doublets. They were changing with time and they could vary depending on the country. 
Some of them had the waistline higher than others. They could be slashed on the front, back and sleeves. They could consist of several fragments which were sewn together, but also some doublets could be completely plain. But it doesn't matter which type of doublet it was, it was usually created in similar way. The difference was the type of fabric which was different for um, some of the social classes and it usually influenced also the type of canvassing. The types and layers of stiffening, padding and canvassing depended not only on the fabric but they were also a part of Taylor's professional secrets and changes in fashion through decades. They were also dependent on which materials were available in specific time and region. Of course that elements, tablets and breeches were worn with some shoes as well as with hats and underwear. But as I mentioned before, I will not concentrate on them today and I will move straight to the next century. Let's think how it happened that the fashion changed from that close-fitting doublets to some type of coats. In 17th century, quite important part of the outfit, especially during cold days, were capes. During first half of the century, many European countries were in the war, called the Thirty Years' War. Therefore, it's not surprising that military outfits influenced also civilian fashion. This was what happened with uh, Justa Corp. This Justa Corp was first worn by military men and it evolved from quite interesting cape known as cassack or mandillion. The cassack was split to elements, fronts, backs and shoulders, which could be also fastened together to form some type of coat with sleeves. In the 1660s the Justa Corp became fashionable also among uh, civilian people and it soon turned out that it's quite proper to wear it even on court. And this particular element of fashion became a symbol of 18th century French fashion. This was the beginning of the coat. This 18th century or even 17th century set is often considered as the beginnings of modern men's suit, which now consists of trousers, waistcoats and some kind of upper element. And I do not name it on purpose, because first it was Justa Corp, which was later replaced by different types of coats or jackets. This Justa Corp went through several transformations. This Justa Corp was most of the time quite ornamental and decorated, especially when worn on cart. When the sleeves and back and front parts narrowed, the French named it Abit. The ornaments did not disappear, they just changed the style. Embroidered habits were worn especially by rich people. In general, creating any kind of ornaments, embroidery or laces takes a lot of time and that's why they were never cheap, especially before the Industrial Revolution. In that time, the trousers are still named breeches in England, but they are named culotte in France. Similarly, like in 17th century, they are worn in 18th century with stockings. There were some times during 17th century when the stockings were fastened to the breeches so that they do not fall down when worn. Other methods to secure them was to use garters. In some cases this fastening was visible but in others it was hidden. In the end of 18th century the tail coat gets into the spotlight. Similarly to the Justa Corp, it comes from the fields, or rather from horse riding, to the court and already in the mid-19th century it is a part of proper evening outfit. At the end of the 18th century, during French Revolution and later in Napoleonic Wars era, the tailcoat becomes more popular. At the beginning of its history it was worn with tight breeches, which will soon disappear and will be replaced by pantaloons and trousers. Breeches ran out of day fashion in the first half of 19th century. Of course, we can see them later on the court and we can find, for example, hunting breeches even during 20th century, but they look quite differently. In the beginning of 19th century, first pantaloons and later trousers are widely used. Pantaloons were calf length and uh, they were fastened at the bottom. Later, they become longer. There were several types of trousers these days, they could be tight or white cut. Mid-19th century is also the time when less formal day dress appears. 
It's just then when, under the influence of English fashion, jacket takes its place on the shoulders of men. First popular type is called lunch jacket. Since that time everything, cut similarly, with no seam between top and low front part, is called jacket. We have for example Norfolk jacket, which is worn for all kind of outdoor and especially country activities. During last quarter of 19th century, dress lounge appeared. This one will soon be known as dinner jacket and it was first worn for non-formal evening events. Great War changed great deal of things. One of them was uh, changing requirements towards formality of clothing. But both wars uh, changed not only that. They mm, influenced the style of living and general ways of clothing. Final effect of those changes was that, for example, showing in shirt and trousers with no waistcoats or jacket turned out to be something normal. In the end of 19th century, it becomes more popular to make sports and in the interwar period, people pay quite much attention to health and sport. All of the sport disciplines require its separate and properly designed type of clothing. About sport suits and clothes, I will tell something more in one of the next episodes. I'm just still gathering resources for that. Now I will just mention that starting from mid 19th and turn of 19th century, bathing and swimming suits, biking, skiing, climbing outfits appeared. Some of them were similar to already existing ones at that time, but others were an innovation. Those were created for both men and women. One of them is Norfolk jacket, worn usually with breeches or plus fours. In the 17th century, 30 years war made an influence on fashion and it's undeniable. Similarly, 20th century First and Second World War influenced the fashion of next decades. Because of Great War, patch pockets became popular for men and women. The Second World War made some new fibers accepted and popular. And if some of them existed even before the war, they were not so much widely accepted. The war itself made an influence on textile industry, so that some new fibers to replace wool and silk were invented and improved. And also some imitations which were created earlier were now more willingly worn by people because everything was in luck. Both wars made also some influence on popularity of knitwear. Knitted scarves, sweaters and vests were now something which can be worn just for everyday use, I mean after the war. Probably it was not the only reason, but in my opinion it was really important that women were making those pieces at homes for soldiers and those pieces were sent to the front. Today one of most popular, if not most commonly worn set are jeans trousers and the shirt or t-shirt. In the next episode, I will explain how shirts become so popular. After all, it's one of the oldest pieces of garments which lasts through all that ages in mostly unchanged form. If you are the topic and you are interested in more videos about historical and modern menswear, subscribe my channel and give a like under this video. For today, it's already everything. See you next time. Music used in this episode are some fragments of Overture by Alexander Nakarada. For links, you can check the description.